And this will allow us to reformulate the stability condition in two ways. One is a topological reformulation and another is a numerical one, the Hilbert Mumford criterion. And then in the second simplification, we're actually gonna assume that X is representations of a quiver, and then we can reformulate the definition of stability again. Um, and this is following a note of King. Okay, so here's what Joe told us last week. We start with X, a quasi-projective variety, and G is a reductive group acting on X. And we needed to linearize this action, um, which meant we chose a line bundle over X and we had a nice lift of the G action. So G is acting on L in a way that's compatible with the action on X and it's also uh, respects the fact that L is a line bundle. So it's linear sense. And then once we have that line bundle, we could say that a point of X was semi-stable with respect to L if there exists some M positive integers and a section of L tensored with itself n times, which is G invariant and satisfies that it doesn't vanish at that point X. And if we look at the set of all the points where it doesn't vanish, then this set should be affine. Okay. So that's the definition of semi-stable. And the definition of stable is that it's semi-stable and in addition, the stabilizer of the point X is finite. And if we restrict the G action, so because S is G invariant, this set will be closed under the action of G and we want the, the action of G on it is closed, meaning that the orbits are closed. Okay, so that's the definition of stable. And Joe explained that we could use this to build nice quotient spaces. So rather than considering all, all the points of X, we restrict to the ones which are semi-stable. And Joe explained that this has a good quotient. I'll remind you in a minute what that means. And Joe also explained that it could be constructed as the direct sum of the global sections of LM, which are G invariant. So this is, becomes a graded ring. We can take proj of that, that's some space, got a map and that is supposed to be a good quotient, which means that if we call this map pi, in particular, the important property for us was that two points upstairs get mapped to the same point downstairs if and only if the closures of their orbits intersect. And each fiber of pi contains a unique closed orbit. So that was pretty good. And Joe also told us that inside, if we look at the stable points, that gives us an open subset and the quotient is even better there. It restricts to a geometric quotient, which has the property that each fiber is exactly one G orbit. And it's closed. Okay. So this is what Joe told us, but it's too complicated for us. So let's, let's make it easier. So I just wanna highlight a few things that basically we don't know how to work with and possibly our computers don't even know how to work with it. Um, so first of all, there's a lot of choices involved in making this linearization. So that is confusing and scary. Um, it's also, in general, hard to compute these invariants. 
Um, it's also hard maybe to check that this set is affine. And then what is this? We don't know, that's hard too. So we're gonna make all of these things easier by reducing the generality that we are studying. So our first simplification is just to assume that X is affine. And then in that case, our line bundles are trivial. So we take L just to be, this is the total space of my line bundle. Okay, so to choose to make a G linearization, then I need a compatible action of G on this line bundle. And the way that I'm going to do that is by choosing a character. Let's call it chi. So this is a homomorphism from G to C star. And then we let G act on X cross C star by the following formula, G acts on X and it acts on Z by scaling it by one over chi G. Um, I read several other sources and people have different sign conventions. So the inverse goes on one side or the other, or maybe neither. Uh, but I decided to just follow what King does. So it might be slightly different to what you're used to if you've seen this stuff before. Okay, so we have our delinearization, which was thing number one that we were scared of, and this was not so bad. And now we need to look at sections of tensor powers. But tensor powers of the trivial line bundle are still the trivial line bundle. So the total space doesn't change, but the action does. Okay. And it may be helpful to keep in mind that we have an isomorphism of rings like this. And that is what's going on here. So now the action has been tensored up. So we act as before on X, but we act by a power on Z. Okay, so that's not so bad either. And so we can see what it means to be an invariant section. So these are going to look like a function on F, function f, sorry, which is a function on x such that if I act by g, I scale the result of f. Okay. So what you can see here is that the action on z will exactly get canceled out by the action here. And so what we're really looking for is f which are functions on the original variety X, which are semi-invariant. Okay. And we denote this So notice that if m were zero, then it would be literally invariant. But now it's just almost invariant. Okay, so that's not so bad either. The functions, the sections in this line bundle can be just determined in terms of some functions on x, which was an affine variety. Okay, so now let's look at the definition that Joe gave us last time of being semi-stable, which is exactly this. So I've just copied down uh, the thing we had from before, except that now I'm calling it P because I've already used up X as my variable. 
So remember that P is chi semi-stable if we could find a section, an invariant section of a tensor power such that the section doesn't vanish on P and XS is affine. So what does it mean now to find such a section? It means there exists F a chi m semi invariant such that f of p is not zero. And what does it mean for xs to be affine? Well, then xs is exactly xf, which is a distinguished. Oops. open in X, so it's always affine. So this condition is trivial. Yeah. Okay. And so what's really, what we've acquired from this is that P is chi semi-stable if there exists a semi-invariant which doesn't vanish at that point. So that's our new definition, and that feels, to me, much more manageable than our old definition. Okay, and then it's stable, we don't have much to say here at this stage, if in addition the stabilizer is finite and the orbits are closed. Okay, so here's some notation. Um, if we let a chi be the direct sum of all the rings, of all the semi-invariants. This becomes a graded ring. So this is the graded algebra of invariants. And by definition, the set of semi-stable points with respect to the linearization given by chi is the union over f's in a chi of positive degree of the f of the xf's and each of these is open and g invariant so the union is open and g invariant okay so now one of the last things that we had from our summary of Joe's talk was this quotient space, GIT quotient space, and now we're going to denote it by a chi, since that's the data of our line bundle here. And Joe told us we could take it to be proj of the direct sum of our invariant sections. But we've just seen that that's the same thing as proj of the graded algebra of invariants. Okay. So this is also less scary than the general thing that we had to deal with last week. And let's recall why. So remember that proj is a scheme whose points correspond to homogeneous prime ideals in the graded ring, which do not contain the irrelevant ideal. So they ideal of all the positive degree stuff. And so if x is a semi-stable point, then let's let i of x be the set of all the f's in this graded ring where x is zero, f of x is zero. So this is an ideal, you can check that it's a homogeneous prime ideal, and by definition of semi-stability, there is at least one f of positive degree where f of x is not zero. So ix does not contain the 
the irrelevant ideal. And so this IX gives a point of the proj. And so this gives us a map, which is the quotient map from the semi-stable points to this projective. And this, as we learned last week, is a good quotient. Um, and let's just remind that this is, by definition, the GIT quotient. And remember um, that we have this fact that two points agree, meaning they define the same ideal IX if and only if the closures of their G orbits don't intersect, or do intersect, sorry. Um, and we say that X1 and X2 are GIT equivalent. If this happens. Okay. And so I'm not going to prove these things, but these are just results that hold for GIT quotients in general. So the set of stable points is a G in G I G invariant subset, which has the property that its image is open inside of the quotient, and that the pre-image of its image is the original thing. So nothing else lands inside the stable part of the quotient. And then when we restrict pi, we get a geometric quotient. So each of the orbits are closed and provide one fiber. Okay, so already the stability and semi-stability condition feel a bit more approachable than they did in the original formulation, but we can reformulate it again in a topological way. And again, we're going to look at the action of G on the total space of this bundle using our character chi. And here is the statement of the proposition that a point P is chi semi-stable if and only if for any lift of P to a point P hat, which consists of a pair in x cross c star, so I'm just requiring that z not be zero. If I look at the orbit of g on this point p hat, so this is living in the total space of the line bundle, and I intersect it with the zero section, I should not get anything. And the stability condition is that in addition, to being semi-stable, the stabilizer of GP hat is finite, and the orbit of GP hat inside of the total space is closed. So this condition maybe is a bit easier before we had to check that all of the orbits of G were closed, and now we just have this one orbit. Okay, so let's try to prove this. So let's think about the semi-stability first. So we start with a point which is semi-stable, and what we want to show is that the orbit of its lift does not intersect the zero section. So here we have our semi-stable point, which means we can find a semi-invariant function that doesn't vanish there. Now we use this function f 
to define a function on the total space, x cross c. And what it does is it takes a pair and it just evaluates the function at x and scales by whatever this complex number is to the power m. And the reason we choose this function to be defined this way is that when we evaluate it on g times a point, so by definition of our action, we get something like this which means that we have f evaluated at g of x times chi to the minus m g z to the m. But now we use that f is a semi-invariant and so we get a chi m g f of x chi to the minus m g z of m. And so these cancel and this is the same as applying the function f tilde to x comma z. So in other words, f tilde is g invariant. And this, I mean, if we think about how we defined semi-invariance originally, it came from looking at invariant sections on total spaces of line bundles. So this is not so surprising. But in particular, a G invariant function is constant on orbits and on orbit closures. So it's constant on the closure of the orbit of P hat with value F of P times Z to the M, which is not zero because Z was not zero. And on the other hand, on the zero section, f is constant with value zero. And so we have an algebraic function with different values on these two closed sets, and so the closed sets must be disjoint. And to go the other direction, we use this idea that Joe introduced last time of the notion of being geometrically reductive. So we can find a G invariant function separating disjoint closed subsets. Okay, so that's the equivalence for semi-stability. For stability, remember what we needed to show was that G, the stabilizer of p hat was finite and the orbit of p hat was closed. So, well, one of these things is easy. So if you look at the definition of the action, if a point of G fixes p hat, it definitely fixes p. And this is already finite from the definition of stability. And so we see that G p hat is also finite. Okay. And we know from the definition of stability that the orbit of G is closed in this distinguished open cutout by S. So we want to show that the orbit of GP hat is closed in all of X cross Z. And instead we're going to look at Z 
which is going to be the set of pairs where this function f tilde of xz agrees with f tilde of p. So this is a closed condition. And so it's enough to show that g p hat is closed in z. Since a closed subset of a closed subset will be closed in the total space. Okay. And what we do is we look at the map, the projection map, and we restrict it to Z, and we can see that it has image inside of, cut of XF. Let's call this map phi, and it's going to be surjective and finite. So there's, this really restricts how, what the options for Z can be. And if we look at the pre-image of the orbit of P inside of Z, it's closed and it's G invariant because so was g of p. But also because phi is a finite map, this set must be a union of finitely many g orbits, and they all have to have the same dimension, which is the same dimension as the original orbit downstairs. which is the same as the dimension of G by our stabilizer condition. Okay, so if you have a union of finitely many orbits of the same dimension, which is closed, then each of those orbits is closed. And in particular, the orbit of p hat is one of these orbits. So that's what we needed to show. And the other direction I will skip, but it uses the same set z and the same ideas. Okay, so maybe that got a little bit technical, but the point now is that our definition of semi-stability can be phrased this way. So we look at this trivial bundle and we look at the orbit of a point in there and we want it to not intersect the zero section. So some of you maybe earlier have seen a definition of semi-stability for actions on vector spaces and this is a generalization of that definition um, using bundles. Okay. But we can reformulate the definition once again. Um, and this will use one parameter subgroups, uh, which is going to let us think about closures of orbits in maybe an easier way. So here's our first definition. So a one parameter subgroup. of G is a morphism of algebraic groups lambda from C star into G. Okay, so also known as a co-character, but in GIT they seem to prefer to call it a one parameter subgroup. So we have a pairing 
um, which takes characters and co-characters and composes them to get algebraic maps from C star to itself, which can be identified with the group Z. So we take our chi and our lambda and we send it to the composition, which sends T to something and that thing must be a power of T. And so we say that the pointy brackets pairing of chi and lambda is N. So that's the power of T that we get when we compose. So if G acts on X and we have a point of X, then lambda induces a morphism. Let's call it lambda sub X from C star into X, where we take a point T and we act on X by lambda of T. So C star is contained inside of A1. And so we make this definition, if this extends to a morphism, let's call it lambda bar, from A1 into X, then we say that the limit as t goes to zero of lambda t applied to x exists and it's equal to the value of this lambda bar at zero. Okay, so let's see some facts that to show us why we care about this if we care about orbits and closures of orbits. So the first thing, which is pretty immediate, is that if the limit exists, it's in the closure of the orbit. And the second thing is a bit more involved. So this is a result due to Kempf, which says that if S in X is closed, and G invariant, and S intersects the closure of some orbit, then any point, so then there's a point in that intersection which is the limit of a one parameter subgroup acting on a point in X, in, in a, a one parameter subgroup acting on the point X. Okay. So there exists a lambda such that the limit as T goes to zero of lambda T acting on X exists and is in G X. Uh, no, that's obvious, sorry. The fact that the thing that's not obvious is that it's in S. So what this is telling us is that when we look at an orbit closure, we may gain some stuff, but all of that stuff can be understood in terms of limits of some one parameter subgroup. We might have, we're gonna to have to choose different one parameter subgroups to get different points, but they, they all exist. And so we can see that one parameter subgroups are going to start playing a role in the kind of criteria that we had, which exactly involved closures of orbits or, and so on. So this is called the Hilbert-Mumford criterion. And it says that if we have a reductive group acting on an affine variety X and chi a character G, so everything as before, then a point is semi-stable if and only if for every one parameter subgroup, lambda of G such that the limit 
of lambda acting on x exists if we pair lambda and chi we get a positive or we get a non-negative number okay and the second condition so x is chi semi-stable if in addition the only it's going to be strictly positive unless lambda is trivial. Okay, so let's see how we can prove this from our topological formulation. So if we start with a point x, we know that that point is semi-stable if and only if for any non-zero z the orbit of the lift x comma z does not intersect the zero section so that was the topological statement that we just proved and so let's let's negate this like i make my discrete math students do all the time so it's not semi-stable if and only if there exists a one parameter subgroup Okay, no, this is not what I would make my students do. I would say if, if the intersection is not empty. And then I would use this criteria. Then I'm using this one here. So if the intersection is not empty, then there exists a lambda. Okay, such that the limit is, is in S. Okay, so if the intersection is not empty, that means there exists a one parameter subgroup lambda with the limit as t goes to zero of lambda t acting on some pair x comma z in s which is the zero section okay but what is lambda of t acting on x comma z this is lambda of t acting on x and chi of lambda of t inverse scaling z. But we know what this is. That's the pairing of chi and lambda. And so that tells us that it's t to the minus n for some n, where the pairing of chi and lambda is equal to n. Okay, but we've said that the limit of this thing is zero. So that means that this needs to go to zero, which means that n needs to be negative. Okay. And the limit the fact that the limit exists means that this limit inside here also exists. So in other words, chi x is not chi semi-stable if and only if there exists a lambda such that the pairing with chi is negative and the limit of lambda acting on x exists. So chi x is chi semi-stable if and only we, if we don't have that. So whenever the limit exists, the pairing needs to be non-negative. Is that okay? Okay. And my notes say that maybe I should skip this, so I will. Um, but it's not so difficult, so maybe it's an exercise. Okay. So now that we have a reformulation of stability, we can think about the quotient. So we have this map, pi. I guess this is not in our notation. And remember that we had that two points were GIT equivalent, meaning that they get mapped to the same point downstairs, if and only if their orbits intersect 
their orbit closures. And we can see that that happens if and only if there exist lifts x1 hat and x2 hat such that the orbit closures upstairs in the total space of the line bundle intersect. And that happens if and only if there exists one parameter subgroups, lambda 1 and lambda 2, which have zero pairing with chi, such that the limit as t goes to zero of, oops, lambda one of t acting on x one, and the limit as t goes to zero of lambda two of t acting in x two are in the same closed G orbit. Okay, so that maybe gives us a more concrete way to look at what it means to be GIT equivalent. But we will reformulate this more uh, soon to something which is even more specific. So I'll just start on the second simplification. So we let G be GLN, and then we think about characters of GLN. So it needs to send G a matrix to something, okay? And because this is a group homomorphism and C star is abelian, this should be conjugation invariant, which means that it's determined by what it does on Jordan normal forms. But then inside of that, diagonal matrices are dense, so it's determined by what it does on diagonal matrices. And you can see that for a diagonal matrix, you're just going to take some power of each of the entries down the diagonal. So it's going to be determined by a list of n integers. But because we can conjugate our diagonal matrices, those lists of n integers should all be the same. We can permute the diagonal entries. So what I'm saying is that the only characters that we have are take the determinant of G and take it to some power theta, where theta is an integer. Okay. So this makes our life easier because we really know, we can really get very hands-on with what our characters are gonna look like. This is actually a little bit too simple. We're not just going to work with GLN, we're going to work with products of GLN, and we're going to work with quiver representations. So I think we've all seen them, but let's review the terminology. And I'm using King's notation, which is not the same as everybody else's. So let's let I be the set of vertices of our quiver. So we have some dots around. E is going to be the set of edges. So we have some directed arrows. We allow loops. Let's call them A1, A2, A3. And T and H tell us which is the tail of the arrow and which is the head of the arrow. So this is the tail of the arrow A1 and this is the head of the arrow A1. This is very confusing because other sources say source and target, and then T has the opposite meaning. So, okay. So now we fix for every red dot, so for every vertex, we fix a positive integer. We have a list of integers. This is called our dimension vector, and a representation of dimension alpha consists of a collection of vector spaces VI, each of dimension alpha I. So we can take them to be C to the AI. And we have morphisms for each A, an edge which goes from the tail vector space to the head vector space. Or in other words, from C to the 
ATI to C to the alpha HI. And so for a fixed dimension vector, we let X be the set of all representations like this, which consists of a bunch of, there's an A missing here, consists of a bunch of linear maps. So in particular, this is a vector space. And in particular, we can give it the structure of an affine variety, which is what we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. And we let G be the product of GLNs, and it's acting on X by pre and post composing the map. So if G is a collection of matrices GI, then G acts on a collection of linear maps phi A by, well, phi A starts here. And so we're going to pre compose with G of alpha PA. Sorry, there's no alpha, G of TA. And to make this into an action, I'm going to do inverse. And we post compose with G of HA. And this gives an action. Okay, so now we have an affine variety with the action of a reductive group. So these are the ingredients that we've been studying. And we also have this observation that two representations of Q, our quiver, they're isomorphic, which means that we have isomorphisms of each of the vector spaces intertwining the phi A maps exactly when they're in the same G orbit. Okay. And that G orbit is exactly, the, the element that you need to multiply in G is exactly given by these isomorphisms. And so what does this tell us? It tells us that if we care about isomorphism classes of representations of Q, we care about the quotient space. Okay, we're going to look at this set X, which is a vector space consisting of lists of linear maps and it's acted on by products of GLN. And we care about the quotient space because two representations in here are isomorphic if they're in the same G orbit. So we should linearize this action, which we've seen means that we just need to choose a character. And we saw that characters of GLN are pretty boring, so characters of products of GLN are also very manageable. So a list of matrices GI goes to the product of their determinants each taken to some power, which we're going to call theta i, where theta i is in z. So if we let theta be the list of these theta i's, which is an i tuple of elements of z, then we denote chi by chi theta. So we have a correspondence between characters and lists of integers. And this list of integers chi also induces a map. From the category. So if we look at the category of quiver representations. And we take its growth and deep group. So here I'm not fixing a dimension vector. Then I can take such a representation and produce an integer. And what I do is I take my representation, which consists of a bunch of vector spaces and a bunch of matrices, and I take the dimension of each of those vector spaces and multiply it by theta i. So in other words, this is the dot product of theta with the dimension vector. 
And this map you can check is additive on short exact sequences. And so we get a map in K theory. And so we'll just remember that for later. That's all. So a problem that we have if we want to consider the action of GLN on these representations is that the stabilizers are large. So diagonal matrices, where you have a bunch of matrices indexed by i and they're all diagonal with the same entry on the diagonal, that when you conjugate by that, everything cancels. So that's going to stabilize any element of this set of representations, which we're going to call diagonal matrices. We're going to denote this following king by delta, but just observe that it's a copy of C star. But in particular, this stabilizer is never finite and we're never going to get stable points. So the whole theory of stability seems like it's gone out the window, but there are two equivalent ways to deal with this. So one is to observe that the action of GL alpha factors through the quotient by these diagonal matrices, which we'll call PGL alpha. And so that exactly resolves this issue of having a large stabilizer. We just kill it. So we work with this group instead. And the other approach, which King does, is to keep working with G L alpha officially, but in your head, everything is mod delta. So we have to replace all of the definitions with up to delta. And so, for example, we replace the condition gx is finite with gx mod delta is finite, etc. So there, it's the same perspective. It's just we're going to keep saying gl alpha, even though secretly we mean pgl alpha. So either way, we should only consider characters chi theta, which really factor through PGL alpha, meaning that on diagonal matrices, they're trivial. Okay. So let's compute chi theta on such a diagonal matrix. So it's the product of the determinant of each diagonal matrix to the power theta i, which means that it's t to the dimension of vi, the theta i, and the dimension of vi for us was just alpha. Okay. So in other words, this is t of the dot product of theta and alpha. And we want this to be one. And that means that we're only interested in theta whose dot product with alpha is zero. So from now on, these are the only characters that we will study, even though GL alpha has more characters, because secretly we want characters of PG alpha. Okay. So let's look in this special case of representations, what one parameter subgroups tell us. So let's let lambda be a one parameter subgroup of GL alpha. And there's no conditions here related to PGL alpha because we can always just compose with the projection. And so we'll always get, there's no condition on lambda. And we let X be a point of this representation space. And so we, as before, observe that lambda induces action. So lambda induces an action of C star on each vector space C alpha i. 
by just restricting. Inside of GL alpha, we have one copy of GL alpha i, and that acts, and then we look at how lambda acts. There. Okay, and so that means we can take the weight decomposition. So we can write C alpha i as a direct sum of C alpha i sub n, where lambda of t acts on C alpha i sub n by t to the n by weight t. And so if we've decomposed our matrices, or we decompose our vector spaces into components, then we can decompose our linear maps phi alpha as well. So we get maps phi a mn, which go from c of alpha t a, so the tail, and we look at the weight n part of that, and we see where we end up if we project to the weight m part of the image. So these are just the components of phi. And let's see how and uh, T acts on, sorry, this set maps phi A. So remember, this is, this is our point X, we're acting on it. And if we recall the definition, we look at lambda like this, lambda a of t composed with i a composed with lambda t a of t inverse. Okay. So by this I mean lambda of t is an integer, and so um, so this is the the t a component of the list of matrices given by lambda t. And so if I look at this big matrix and I look at the MN component, then what happens over here is that lambda T acts by N. So I get a T to the minus N over here and lambda T over here acts by M. So lambda T acting on the component by a m n is just scaling by a, by t to the m minus n. Okay, so now we know how lambda t acts on these components, and these components determine phi completely. And so, when will the limit exist? The limit exists if and only if, well, whenever this starts going to infinity, we're going to have a problem. So we need this to be zero. So we need that phi m n of a is equal to zero whenever m is less than n. And so that tells us that the limit exists if and only if each phi a is block upper triangular and if we take that limit here then whenever m is not equal to n this goes to zero. So the only time we have something left in the limit is when m is equal to n meaning the diagonal terms and so the limit as t goes to zero of lambda t of phi a is just the diagonal stuff.
So in other words, if we let For each i, we let wi greater than or equal to n be the sum of all the weight spaces, which are greater than or equal to n, then because these maps here are upper triangular, we see that the maps by a restrict to maps from W T A greater than or equal to N to W H A greater than or equal to N. In other words, we get a sub-representation. So if X N is equal to these W I greater than or equal to N, together with the restrictions of the phi's, We get a sub representation of x for each n. So obviously, the dimension vector is going to become smaller as we do this. And so we get a filtration of x, and so it's a decreasing filtration indexed by integers. So inside of xn, we have xn plus 1 and xn plus 2, and so on. And this has the property that for n sufficiently small, we get all of x. So because everything is finite dimensional, we can put bounds on our weights that actually appear. And for n sufficiently large, we don't have any weights, anything of that weight, and so xn is zero. So this is a complete filtration indexed by some finite set of integers. And if lambda is non-trivial, okay, so earlier non-trivial meant not equal to one, but now that means not in this diagonal matrix set then the filtration is proper. So not everything has the same weight, in other words. So there exists n with the xn piece being strictly between zero and x. And the observation that we made is that the limit as t goes to zero of this x is equal to the direct sum of the nth weight spaces. So we get all of C alpha i this way, but we only have the diagonal, matri diagonal parts. And so this is exactly the associated graded Of the filtration. Okay, so here is a summary of what we learned. Um, so if x is a point, which is a representation of q, and lambda is a one parameter subgroup such that the limit exists, then lambda induces a filtration on x and the limit is the associated graded of this filtration. And one can also show, it's not so hard, given a Z graded filtration of X, you can construct a lambda which induces this filtration. So we have this correspondence between filtrations and one parameter subgroups, and that lets us compute limits as associated graded, which is very convenient. So from this, what do we learn about stability? So to say something about stability, we need to talk about the interaction between the character and the one parameter subgroup because our most recent stability condition 
involved looking at the sign of the pairing between chi and lambda. So remember that we're only interested in thetas, which have a dot product of zero with alpha, so we can make that assumption. And let's suppose that we have some one parameter subgroup acting on x and the limit exists and it's the associated graded as above. Then we can compute the pairing of chi and lambda very explicitly as follows. So if we remember how the computation goes, we should compose these two and apply them to t. And that's going to give us t to some power. And what is that power? Well, for each vertex, we get theta i times the determinant of lambda t. And the determinant of lambda t is for each integer n, we look at the nth weight space. So we look at the dimension of c alpha i n. And on that piece, we get a block with t to the n. So we get n times the dimension of that weight space. Okay. So let's rearrange this sum. Let's bring the n to the outside. And so for each n, we get the dot product of theta i with the nth weight spaces. And so that's exactly n times theta i applied to this quotient. So that if I take this quotient, I'm exactly picking out the nth weight spaces. And remember this, here I'm viewing my theta as a map from k0 to z. But it's just saying take the dot product with the dimension vector here. And now I expand this sum and I use, um, I use that theta was additive on short exact sequences. So this is theta of xn minus theta of xn plus one. And if I expand out this sum, and I remember that eventually um, n becomes small. And when n is very small, I get theta of x and that's zero. And when n is very large, I get theta of zero and that's also zero. So there's only finitely many non-zero terms in this sum. And I can see that when I expand, I get cancellations. And I just get the sum over integers n of theta of xn. Okay. So this was a little bit confusing to me at first because in, in here, x does not appear. So it doesn't matter which point x you take as long as it's a semi-stable point. Okay. So we're going to use this and we're going to reformulate the definition of semi-stability and stability once again. And so we start with a definition that makes sense already in the category of representations. So we say that a representation x is theta semi-stable if theta of x is equal to zero and every sub-object x prime of x satisfies that theta of x prime is greater than or equal to zero. Again, King has some sign conventions which are different from other people, but this is what he does. Um, and so you should maybe compare, if you're familiar with vector bundles, the definition of slope stability. This is not unrelated. And the point x is theta stable if this equality, this inequality, is strict if x is not trivial. So it's a proper sub-object. And so this is a definition which seems to make a lot of sense for representations. Uh, and the theorem of King is that x is semi-stable with respect to chi, if and only if it's semi-stable in this sense with respect to theta. and semi-stable, we can remove that. So stability is also correct. Okay. 
So let me, on the last page of the notes is a list of all the theorems that we have proven. So I'm gonna just copy this one so that we can look at the statement while we prove the next thing. Okay, so I'm gonna shrink it. That didn't work that well. Never mind. Okay, maybe you can read that, maybe not. So um, the first observation to make is that this condition that theta of x is equal to zero is a condition that we already just assume all the time. We're only interested in thetas that have that property. So if theta of x is the dot product of theta with the dimension vector of x, and we always assume that that's zero, and that's equivalent to um, saying that chi applied to uh, diagonal matrices is one. Okay, so now let's assume that we have a semi-stable point. So let's let x be chi theta semi-stable. Okay, and according to this tiny post-it note in the corner, it tells us that whenever the limit exists, the pairing is non-negative. Okay, so now we want to prove that it is semi-stable in this sense, which means we need to look at a sub-object and we need to look at theta of that sub-object. So let's let x prime inside of x be a sub-representation. Okay. And let's let lambda be the one parameter subgroup that we get corresponding to the filtration that has two steps like this. And an observation to make is that if x prime is proper, then lambda is non-trivial because we have a an interesting filtration. Okay, but now we have a filtration and we have one parameter subgroup and so that means that the limit of this one parameter subgroup exists and is equal to the associated graded of this filtration and so that tells us that the pairing is positive non-negative, and that's according to that back there. I don't think this is helpful. Okay, so what do we know though? We just said that we could calculate this as the sum of the thetas of the pieces in our filtration. So it's theta of x plus theta of x prime plus theta of zero. Okay, but these guys are zero. And so this is theta of x prime. And so it has to be non-negative, which is what we wanted. So x is theta semi-stable. Okay, now what if x is actually chi-stable? Then according to our little post-it note up here, if the limit exists and lambda is not trivial, then the pairing should be non-zero. And we can see that already here. So if x prime is proper, then lambda is not contained in delta, so it's not trivial, and that tells us that this pairing is strictly positive, and so theta of x prime is strictly positive. So x is theta 
stable. So at this stage, by the time we've reformulated so many times from the definitions that Joe gave us last week, this is not so hard to prove. Okay, let's do the other direction. So we assume that X is theta semi-stable and we want to show that it's chi semi-stable, meaning that we want to show that whenever this thing exists, the pairing is non-negative. Well, if the, if the pairing exists, or if the limit exists, then X has a filtration. Um, the piece is called XN, and the pairing of X with lambda is the, th is the sum of theta of these pieces. Okay. But, Theta semi-stability tells us that these thetas are positive or non-negative. And so this thing here is non-negative too. And so, so X is semi-stable with respect to chi. And so the last thing to show is that if X is theta stable, then it's chi theta stable, which means that we need to show that if the limit exists and lambda is not trivial, then the pairing is strictly positive. So if lambda is not trivial, then we know that xn is non-trivial for some n. So we know that the filtration is non-trivial. But then theta stability tells us that theta of xn is strictly positive. And so this sum here has at least one strictly positive term in it, and the rest are non-negative. And so the pairing is positive. And so now let me erase this post-it note. OK. Um, and so now this is the definition that we're working with. We look for objects. When we apply theta, we get zero, and every sub-object is non-negative, and stability means that this equality should be strict. Okay, so let's finally look at an example. So here's a quiver, which we've seen before. So it has two vertices. They are called one and one prime. And we have two arrows from one to itself, and one arrow in each direction. And we look at the dimension vector, with n comma one. Okay. So what does it mean to give an element of the representation space? It means that we have one map corresponding to this top arrow from Cn to Cn, another map corresponding to the bottom arrow, and then a map i from C to Cn and a map J from Cn to C. So this is looking familiar from Anthony's talks. And let's choose theta. So it has two components and we're going to require that the first one be non, let's make it strictly positive. Okay, and then if I take the dot product of theta with alpha, then I get theta one times n plus theta one prime. And that's supposed to be zero. And so I can see that I should only look at theta one prime being equal to minus n times theta one. So these are the kinds of thetas that we can look at. And we ask, when is a quadruple, a, b, i, j, theta semi-stable? So we need to look at sub-representations. I'm going to call it w, but we need to remember that w consists of a subspace of cn and a subspace of c that are compatible with these arrows, a, b, i, j. And I'm going to denote its dimension vector by beta. And beta 1 prime, we see only has two options, it's either zero or one. 
because it's a subspace of C. Okay, and so we see that theta of W is theta one times beta one minus n theta one beta one prime. And semi-stability tells us that this is supposed to be non-negative. So if beta one is equal to zero, we have no problem. We have a positive number times a non-negative number. But if beta one prime is not equal to zero, then it's equal to one. And so we get theta one times beta one minus n, and that's supposed to be greater than or equal to zero. And that can only happen if beta one is greater than or equal to n. But beta one is the dimension of a subspace of Cn, and so that can only happen if beta one is actually n. And so W was actually the whole thing to begin with. Okay. Um, a remark here is that you can already see that in this case, theta stability and semi-stability are equivalent. We never get zero if beta one is not zero. Okay. Um, so in other words, any time we could find a vector subspace of Cn, which contains the image of I and is closed under A and B, then W, which we would get by taking this vector space W1 together with C, is a sub-representation of the thing that we started with, but we just saw that there are no tri non-trivial sub-representations, so W1 is equal to Cn. And the observation is that this is exactly Anthony's stability condition from the first lectures. It was that we had um, we had these maps i a b i and j, and we had this stability condition that if something contained i of one and was closed under acting by a and b, then it had to be all of c. Okay. So now um, we see that it's Emily, also. sorry. Yeah. Um, can I just interrupt? Um, maybe, are you going to talk about um, the case where theta equals zero as well? No, I was not. Do you have something <laughs> to say? Uh, well, I mean, so the, the definition that uh, you've given of theta stability and semi stability, um, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's pretty easy in the case where theta equals zero. Um, if you scroll sure. maybe to, to, to where it is. So theta yeah. equals zero is an allowable choice from what you said. But there are no stable points. And yeah, so there, um, every point is semi-stable and there are no stable points. Uh, well, sorry, no, that's, um, that's not right. The, the stable points are the ones that correspond to simple um, representations. Right, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so um, maybe this will come up uh, in connection with what you're about to say about questions. Yes, probably. All right, thank you. Okay, so now um, that we have a definition of stability and semi-stability that we can understand, we can finish by saying some things about the quotient space. So an exercise in linear algebra somehow, in the rank nullity theorem, is that, um, if you have a map of theta semi-stable representations, then the co-kernel, kernel, and image are all theta semi-stable as well. And so theta, theta semi-stable representations form an abelian category. And as Anthony was mentioning, the simple objects are exactly 
the stable ones. I guess that's also an exercise. And so because this category has nice finiteness properties, we have a notion of Jordan Holder filtrations. Meaning filtrations by subobjects where each subquotient is simple or equivalently stable. Okay. So the stable objects have boring filtrations, and the simple objects, sem semi simple objects, can be filtered in this way. Um, and so we can look at what our orbits look like. So a point, a semi-stable point of the representation category has a closed G orbit if and only if it's a direct sum of theta stable objects, which is what we call a polystable object. So the reason for this is that if it's in a closed G orbit, then that means that the limit as t goes to zero is in the g orbit. For any lambda where the limit exists. But if we take the Jordan Holder filtration of x and take the lambda corresponding to the Jordan Holder filtration, then that then that limit does exist and it's equal to the associated graded. Which is a direct sum of simples. And so we can see when two points have the same image, it happens exactly when their Jordan Holder filtrations have associated gradients which are isomorphic, meaning that they have the same composition factors. So this is the definition of S equivalent that I learned for vector bundles. And it seems has a very different flavor to me of the original definition, but we now see that they are equivalent. And that is all that I wanted to say. I guess I can say I, I thought I would run out of time, but um, we only talked about representations of quivers. And so this example does not exactly cover Anthony's example because we want in addition the condition that a bracket b is equal to zero. And what King remarks in his paper is that you can put these conditions on your quivers. So you only want representations that satisfy certain conditions, but these are closed conditions. So these are closed um, varieties in our vector space and everything just behaves nicely and you can just proceed. And so we only look at the stable points which also satisfy this condition and the semi-stable points which also satisfy this condition. And so that is how we can get the Hilbert scheme as a sub-scheme of this quotient. <laughs>